Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the next episode in the C++ for Java Developer series. In this episode, we will be going over the static keyword in its several different contexts. You can skip to the next bookmark if you would want to see that right away. First, I'm going to go over the solution to the last problem in the last tutorial. This was to create a dynamic array or a list. So if I run this program, you can see that we get the output that you would expect. All it does is it creates a list with a capacity of one, then it loops from 10 to zero, adding new elements to the list and growing dynamically as it does so. And we can see from printing it that it does exactly that. Then we can sort it, which sorts it in ascending order. And finally, we destroy the list to clean up the memory. So how does this work? Well, let's jump into the create list function and see how this works. So you can see that this create list function first creates a structure that is empty. And this structure is defined exactly how we defined it in the last episode. So inside we initialize the data to a new int array. So this assigns it to a new pointer and we give it the capacity. This is the only change I've made is I've just changed the size word that I use to capacity because it makes a little bit more sense. Next, we set the list capacity, which I said was the max size in the last tutorial, but changed it to capacity because it makes a little bit more sense to this capacity that the user passed in. And we set the list size to zero since it has no elements. And then we return this newly created list. This gives us a list to work with. Uh, next function that's important is this add function. How does this work? Well, it takes in a reference to a list. And what we do is first we check and see if the size plus one is going to be greater than the capacity. If that's true, then we need to grow the list because we can't add a new element. We'll take a look at that in a minute. If it's not true, we can just add the element. So what we do here is we say list.data size equals the new element you want to add. And then we increase the size by one. So if we had three elements in a list like this, then index three would be this next space. And if A was five, five would be placed in the next available index. Now let's take a look at this grow list function. So what happens if we're going to exceed the capacity? Well, we need more room. So how do we do that? Well, we have to do a couple of different things, but it's not that bad. First, I get a pointer to the old data. This is so that we can copy the old elements to the new array or the new memory once we allocate it. So then I get the old maximum size for the same reason, which is the list's capacity. And then I grow the list capacity by two. So I just say, I want to have double the amount of space that I had before so I can add more elements. So if the list capacity was three, then it would grow to six and we could add up to six elements in the new list. Finally, we copy the data. So we first initialize a new data. We say list.data equals a new int array, which gives us a new pointer with new memory to work with. And we assign it to the new capacity. Then we loop through the old maximum size copy all of the old data to the new data. And finally, we delete the old data so that we don't end up with a memory leak. And we can delete the old data because we have already copied it over to the new one and no one has a reference to this anymore if we've done our work correctly. So that grow list is a little bit tricky, but it should make sense if you're familiar with dynamic arrays. So the print list and sort are pretty familiar. You shouldn't have too much trouble with these. The sort is just a very generic sort algorithm. I do a double loop and then I compare the previous element to the next element and swap them if the previous element is greater than the next element, uh, which swaps it in ascending order. Then the print method just prints out a bracket and prints the data with commas in between if needed and then an end bracket. And then the destroy one is the only other one of importance. We delete the data which is important, otherwise we will have memory leaks. And then we set the size capacity to zero and the data to null pointer. This way, if anybody accidentally accesses this list in the future and it's been destroyed, they'll immediately crash because they'll be trying to operate with a null pointer, which will be invalid. So this is just sort of a safety protocol, which is good to do in every single case. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about the static keyword. The static keyword has four different meanings depending on the context it's used in C++. We'll talk about three of those meanings today because the fourth one is object-oriented programming, which we won't be talking about till we talk about object-oriented programming. <laughs> so what are these meanings of static that were carried over from the C days? Well, basically the first version of static that we have can mean internal linkage or local storage duration. This is what I have highlighted in red, and I have it highlighted in red because it can be a very bad idea in certain instances. Imagine we have this context where we have a header file, foo.h, an implementation file or translation unit, foo.cpp. 
and then another implementation file, bar.cpp. These two are completely different, but foo.cpp will include foo.h. Let's imagine that both of these files include foo.h, and foo.h declares an integer inside of it that is declared static. What happens to this bad idea? Well, if you assign this bad idea to 5 inside of foo.cpp, this will have no meaning whatsoever to bar.cpp. When bar.cpp sees it, it will still be 0. Bar.cpp can then assign it to 10, and it will have no context to foo.cpp. It can assign it to whatever it wants, and it will not affect this. Essentially what happens is this has internal linkage within each of these translation units or implementation file. In other words, they each get their own version. This can be very bad if you have larger objects and you're expecting it to remain the same throughout translation units, when in reality you're actually changing it every time because each CPP file gets its own version of this variable. Now, you can also declare a function static and put it inside of a header file, and I called this not useful because it's just not that useful. What ends up happening is when you declare this static, the same exact thing as a variable. Each implementation file that calls this function will simply call its own version of the function. So this not useful function will be copied for foo.cpp, copied for bar.cpp, and whatever implementation file calls it. This is essentially the same thing as doing the inline keyword. It is slightly different, which is why I would advise not using it. So this version of static means you should never use it inside of a header file. However, inside of an implementation file, it's okay. It's okay because if you declare an integer static inside the implementation file, it means the same thing. This will only exist here and this is the only version of okay here. Now, that means if you declared a static okay here variable inside of bar.cpp, it also gets its own version of this variable. But that makes sense to programmers, which is why I think it's okay to use the static keyword in implementation files. Essentially, these are private variables that are only visible to these implementation files if you want to think about it in an object-oriented sense. The second context of static keyword is what I like to call static member functions. What is a static member function? Well, it is basically the same thing as the static keyword for variables defined inside of an implementation file. If you tell the compiler that this function is static, that compiler then says, oh, this function only exists inside of this file. Therefore, it can make certain optimizations about this function knowing it will never be used outside of this file. I like to think of these as you would a private member function. Say you need a helper function inside of a CPP translation unit. What you can do is just define a static function inside of there and it will only be visible to all of the objects inside of this file and you don't have to worry about naming collisions or anything like that. So this one I would consider pretty useful. The last context of the static keyword, which is in blue, is local static. This one is a bit unique in that you don't see it in other programming languages. What this static keyword does is basically the first time you call this function, this unique ID is going to be initialized to zero. Then when you call this function the second time, it's going to completely ignore this line of code and just continue on with the function. And if UID is used, it will change it accordingly. So, in other words, if we assign this to zero the first time, then we get to the end of the function, it will now be one. The next time you call this function, this will be one. It will not be zero. Then it will increment to two, and then the next time it will increment to three, so on and so forth. This is useful for unique IDs and for static buffers. Say you need a buffer of characters to manipulate some string data, this is a perfect use for this static keyword. This is also useful for creating singletons, and we'll explore all of this in just a second. So these are the three main uses of the static keyword. There is one more use, which I guess is technically the main use of the static keyword in C++, which is the OOP sense of the word. However, we are not going to be talking about OOP until we cover that in a later C++ tutorial. With all of this knowledge, let's go ahead and experiment with the static keyword and see how it works in actuality. All right, so I'm inside of main.cpp. Let's go ahead and experiment with the first context I talked about, which is the internal linkage of the keyword static. I'll create a file foo.h, and we'll create a foo.cpp over here. And this will just be for experimentation purposes. So let's go ahead and we'll go into here and create a namespace, call this foo, 
and I'm going to declare a static integer, which we'll just call bad idea. This is that first initialization that I talked about that we don't really ever want to do. So if we initialize bad idea to zero inside of here, which we may actually not be able to do, uh, and then if we go into foo.cpp, and let's actually create a function for this too, so we can operate on this. We'll call this void print bad idea, which will just display the value of bad idea inside of foo.cpp. So this will include foo.h, and we'll just simply declare the namespace, declare the function, and inside of the function, uh, we will simply print f bad idea. And we'll have to do a percent %d, and we'll also have to include std io. All right, so now we have all of this sort of set up. And let's also go ahead and we'll assign bad idea to one plus itself. So we'll just add one every time we call bad idea in here, just to hammer home what happens. Now inside of main.cpp, I'll go ahead and include foo.h as well. Inside of main.cpp, I'll go ahead and say bad idea equals 10. Or rather, we should say foo colon colon bad idea equals 10. This colon colon is the scope operator. And that basically means I want to access this variable, which is a part of the foo namespace. So now if we go ahead and print f uh, main.cpp bad idea, and we print foo bad idea, we should see 10 here. And I'm going to add in a new line here, which I believe we forgot inside of our foo.cpp. Yes, so I'm going to add in a new line here as well. Then we'll go ahead and we'll call foo print bad idea. And then we'll call foo print bad idea again, which should change it. And I'll just copy this line and we'll print it again. I'm going to remove all of this because this isn't very necessary now. Okay, so what should we expect to happen? Well, this foo bad idea is declared right here. So this should be 10. And then this one should be zero since we declared it to be zero here and it will still be zero by the time we get to this point, or actually it will be one since we add one to it. And then the second time we call it, it should be two, and this one should still be 10. So let's run this and see what happens if we don't get any compile errors. All right, so this illustrates exactly why this is a bad reason. Look at this. So inside of main.cpp, bad idea is 10. It's one, then it's two, just like we thought when we call it here, but it's still 10 here. This is a very bad idea for several reasons. Now every single implementation unit will have a different version of this variable and you will have no idea why that is. So do not do this. This is a bad idea. <laughs> now let's talk about when it is a good idea. Let's say we have some function uh, that's going to do some fancy arithmetic. So let's go ahead and define this function inside of foo.cpp. Now, it turns out that we have several other functions inside of this file that also use this fancy arithmetic, and we need a variable that's visible only to this implementation unit. Well, we can go ahead and declare a static int local static variable, and we'll call this just zero. This means this variable is only visible to this implementation file. No other files can access it. So we can simply say local static equals 10 here, and we'll just print local static here. And say at the end of it, we multiply it by two. Then that means the next time we call this function, it will retain its value and continue on just like normal. This is very similar to private member variables. So then if we go ahead and call this function, let's see if it behaves the same way we would think. So we'll say foo, fancy arithmetic, and we'll call it three times, and it should double in value every time we call it. So if we run this, oh, <laughs> and it's not gonna do anything because I redeclare it right here. So let's remove this line of code. Now, if we run this, it should be 10 at first and double in size every time. So if we run this, we get 10, then we get 20, then we get 40. Cool, so that works just like a private member variable would. Now let's say you have some helper functions you need inside of this file. Well, we could forward declare that function at the top of the file, which is what I like to do since this is more of an internal function, and we'll call this internal function. Now this internal function could do whatever you need it to do, and we'll declare it down here. 
Notice how the green line will disappear once we declare the implementation below. This just means if you declare it at the top like this, that you will be able to access this function anywhere inside of this file. But now you can essentially call this internal function, which says I am only visible in here from this file. And this means that this will not be visible to any other files. So if we called internal function within here, we should see that message printed out. And then we could go ahead and redefine this in main.cpp. So you could even go ahead and say static void internal function. And we could print I am in main.cpp. And now this will be in a different file and have a completely different context. So you can rename these functions and not have to worry about them showing up in different functions. If we go ahead and run this, we should see if we call fancy arithmetic, uh, we should see this string, which is I am only visible in here. And then if we call internal function inside of main, we should see I am in main.cpp. So if we run this, that is exactly what we get. We get I am only visible in here, which is declared in foo. And then we get I am in main.cpp, which is declared right here. So you can think of these like private member variables. They can have the same names and they will not be visible to other files, but only declare these inside of CPP files. Finally, let's talk about local static variables. Let's remove this real quickly because it's not really necessary anymore. And inside of foo, I'm going to create a function called int get UID, which will return a unique ID every time it's called. So if we simply delete all this because it's not necessary, we could go ahead and say uh, int get UID. And we can create this very simply. We can just say static int UID equals zero return UID plus plus. So what this will do is it will return the UID and then it will increment it so that you will get zero returned and then it will be one the next time you call this. You could alternatively declare this by just having a static int UID variable here and then you could return it the same way you do here. The advantage though to doing it this way is that we know exactly when this will get initialized. This will get initialized the first time get UID is called and be initialized from then on forth. Whereas with the alternative method, we do not know when it's initialized. So if we simply go ahead and say printf UID percent D slash N, we can go ahead and say foo get UID. And if we duplicate this, it should be unique every time we call it. So if we run this, you see that not only is it unique, but we get zero, one, two, three, which is what we should expect. So like I said before, this is initialized the first time this function is called, and then it changes every time because this line of code is essentially ignored and we just retain the same value that it had before. All right, this is all the context that static keyword has in C++. It's pretty complicated, but it is useful in a lot of different scenarios. Like I said, I tend to prefer static member functions for creating pseudo private member functions where this is basically my private member only visible inside of this foo namespace. I like to use the static local keyword whenever I need buffers. So if I'm doing some sort of string manipulation, it can be useful to have a buffer of characters. That's 128 bytes. Now all of a sudden I have a buffer to work with if I need to do some simple string arithmetic and this will always be there for me to use and it will not get allocated new every time. And finally, I like to use the static keyword for local variables like this. If I have some uh, local variable that I only want to be defined within foo, this will only be defined within foo. The only downside to having it declared like this is that we do not know when it will be initialized. All right, with all that said, I am not going to have a challenge for this video, but in the next episode, we will not be talking about memory management. Instead, we will be talking about templates, which are very important in C++, and I want to go over them so that we can do more interesting programming. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, please hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next tutorial.